This story is from a female's point of view. When I was in college, I worked in an Applebee's to make ends meet. I worked there from freshman year to senior year, so I had some regular customers. I had one that tipped me the most and his name was Larry. Anyways, one day, while at work, I received a friend request on Facebook from a guy that was really attractive. I checked his page out before I accepted it, and it seemed legit, and he was in my city. As soon as I accepted it, he messaged me and said, hey, thanks for accepting my request. That was usually code for creep when someone does that, but he was cute. I said no problem, and we continued to converse. Eventually, after a few days chatting, we decided to go on a date. I decided to meet at Chili's on a Friday at 6 p.m. because I don't know this guy, and maybe he's crazy. I arrived at the restaurant before him, and I messaged him to let him know that our table is under my name, and he said okay. After about 20 minutes, I messaged him back, but he didn't reply until 20 minutes later telling me that he wasn't going to make it. I was pissed, but I ordered and ate my food. I left and I drove home. When I got to my apartment, I walked up the stairs to get to my apartment and I hear something behind me. I get to my door, turn to my left, and I see a man standing at the bottom of the stairs looking at me. I look closer and I see that it's Larry, my customer at work. I frantically asked him, what is he doing here? And he told me it's okay. Always make sure you make it home safe. Then he said, sorry, I couldn't make it to the date. I said, what? I tried unlocking my door, but I dropped my keys and he started running up the stairs yelling, it's not what you think. I grabbed the keys, unlocked the door and ran inside, closing my door behind me. He started banging on my door, telling me he was my best customer and he deserved me. I called the cops and they caught him outside in my car, just sitting there calmly. After that, I deleted all of my social media and dating apps. Then I quit my job at Applebee's. Ever since that experience, I'm very paranoid of people's intentions and I always carry a pistol. This story happened to me on the deep web. The deep web is basically the hidden internet that contains dark content, such as drugs, pedophiles, hitmen, and torture. None of that really interests me. The only reason why I was on the deep web was to look for government secrets and stuff like that. After looking for links that had to do with that type of stuff, I eventually got bored and decided to find other things on the deep web. I had a VPN on, so if I ever came across something illegal, I wouldn't get caught. I then came across a link that led me to his site. It was called the Devil's Chamber. It gave a description of the website. Basically, it was a snuff film, aka torture and murder films. There was a black video box with a play button. I was very curious and clicked on the play button. A black screen popped up with a timer and a live chat box with people waiting for something. The timer said 3 minutes till showtime. I got curious and typed in the chat what everyone was waiting for. They all said, a murder live stream. I didn't like this and I put my cursor over the X. But as soon as I was going to click out, text appeared on the black screen that said, It's showtime. I watched and waited to see what was going to happen. Just then, a screen appeared with a woman tied to a chair in a dimly lit room with a door. Then, someone with a mask appeared on screen as well. The person in the mask stared at the camera and said, It's time for pain. He then opened the door and closed it behind him. 
A few seconds later, he came out with a dog tied to a chain. The dog was barking like crazy in a really aggressive way. It was a pit bull, and I knew it was about to happen. The pit bull lunged at the woman, attacking her while still tied to the chair. She was screaming in pain as the dog was biting and chewing her apart. A few minutes later, she stopped screaming, and she was dead. The person in the mask then walked out of the room with the dog leaving the woman whose flesh was literally torn apart. I closed out immediately and deleted the Tor browser. I will never, and I repeat, never go back on the deep web again. I had three really good friends, and their name were Kevin, Ryan, and Tommy. Every summer our parents would take us on a vacation. We always stayed in a remote cabin in the forest of Minnesota. The cabin was located on a large island in the middle of Lake Vermilion. Eventually, when we were old enough, our parents let us go to the cabin on our own for the first time. When we got there, we parked the car on the gravel road beside the lake. Then we had to take a boat across the lake, about half a mile to reach the cabin. There were a few other cabins on the island, but they were all at least half a mile away. The cabin was quite small and only had a kitchen, a bathroom, and two bedrooms. At night, it was pitch black. There were no street lights for miles and the only light came from the moon. There were no curtains on the windows, so when you were sleeping at night, you could see the moon shining down on the trees in the lake outside. On the third night of our trip, we set up a campfire by the edge of the lake. The moon was full and a pale white glow was shimmering across the lake. We were gazing up at the stars when all of a sudden we heard a splashing sound, as if something was moving about in the water. Ryan suddenly stood up and pointed saying, what the hell is that? We all looked in the direction he was pointing peering into the darkness. After a while, I could make out what he was pointing at. I'll never forget the feeling of terror that came over me. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and goosebumps appeared on my arms. I was paralyzed in fear. Out in the middle of the lake, there was a woman's head. It was just floating there on the surface of the water, staring directly at us. She had pale white skin and long black hair. Her hair was matted to her face. The rest of her was submerged or not even there. We tried to tell ourselves that it was just a loon. They are black and white birds that hunt at night, diving deep into the water. It didn't look like a loon, but that's what we tried to convince ourselves it was. We threw some more wood on the fire and tried to forget about it, but it still gave me the creeps. About an hour later, I had to go to the toilet, so I walked down to the edge of the dock and peed into the lake. Looking out over the moonlit lake, I noticed the thing was still there. But now it was much closer. It still looked like the woman's head and it still seemed to be staring right at me. Its face was still extremely pale, as if it hadn't been out in the sun for years and I could easily make out some facial features. The eyes and the nose. A feeling of incredible unease came over me as I realized it couldn't be a loon. There was no way a loon could just tread water for that long. There were no ripples around it either. It wasn't moving at all. It was just standing there, stiff as a board, submerged in the water. I immediately zipped up my pants and ran back up to the dock to where my friends were, sitting around the campfire. I told them what I'd seen but none of them dared to go down to the dock to take a closer look. We tried to tell ourselves it was just a log or a tree branch, just floating out in the water. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy too. None of us really believed that. We went back into the cabin and we shut the door, locking it behind us. 
It was very late and we just needed sleep. None of us mentioned a thing in the lake. We were all trying to avoid talking about it, honestly. There were no curtains on the windows and I was getting ready for bed. I couldn't help but taking one last look. Peering out of the window, I could see the lake clearly, illuminated by the full moon. But the thing wasn't there anymore. It had completely vanished. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking it was a log that just floated away, or else it sank below the surface, or perhaps it had been a loom and it finally flown away. It was very hot that night and we had to sleep with the windows open. My friend Tommy and I slept in one bedroom and my two other friends slept in the other. We left our bedroom doors open. I was finding it hard to sleep, very, very hard. It was the middle of the summer and there wasn't even a slight breeze. The heat was stifling. As I lay there, I thought I could hear someone walking around outside the cabin. I kept my eyes tightly shut and tried to tell myself it was just my imagination. It sounded like someone with bare, wet feet pacing back and forth. I was trembling with fear, but I felt so weak I, I couldn't move. The footsteps, they sounded like they were walking up the steps to the cabin door. I wanted to shout out to my friends, but I was frozen in terror. Then the footsteps turned around and sounded like they were running down the steps and toward the lake. After a while, the footsteps faded away. I reached over and shook my friend Tommy. He was already awake and he claimed he had heard the footsteps as well. Just then, I was startled to see Ryan coming running into our room. When he stepped into the moonlight, I could see his face and the expression on it was very, very disturbing. He told us, we need to leave. I asked why, what did you hear? He said, let's just go, he insisted. Let's get to the boat and it's time to go. He wouldn't answer. He just ran back into his room. We followed him and found Kevin sitting on his bed, already packing up his things. Ryan was running around frantically grabbing his stuff and stuffing it into a bag. What's wrong? I demanded. Ryan, what the hell is wrong with you? Tell us. He just stopped in his tracks and stared at me. There was a haunted look in his eyes. I would never forget what he said. He told us he was turning over in his bed to get more comfortable when he suddenly saw at the top right corner of his window someone was peeking in. As soon as he set his eyes on it, the face vanished. He said all he saw was long black hair hanging down the window, ghostly white skin and one large eye staring at him. When he said that it chilled us to the bone, we realized that if the face was in the top right corner of the window, that meant the thing had to be damn near eight feet tall or else floating in midair. I felt like I was going to be sick. Let's just go, Ryan said in a very serious tone. Let's just go now. We all agreed and packed our stuff up as quickly as we could. We grabbed our bags and ran out of the cabin, locking the door behind us. As we scrambled down the front steps, I glanced to the side and I saw footprints, bare, wet footprints in the dirt all around the cabin. We ran down to the boat and threw our stuff in. We untied the boat from the dock and we sped off. I looked back over my shoulder and stared at the island, but I didn't see anything moving. However, I had the strangest feeling that someone or something was watching us. When we finally reached the other side of the lake, we tied up the boat, stuffed our backpacks in the car and drove off. We had been driving for about 10 minutes when, out of the blue, Ryan suddenly broke down sobbing. He kept saying over and over, what was it guys? What was it? What did we see? On the way, 
We called our parents to tell them what happened. Ryan was freaking out, and we didn't know what to do. They told us to just get home safely and quickly. My friend's dad went up to the cabin a few days later and said he saw nothing out of the ordinary. However, he did mention that there were bare, wet footprints all around the cabin, which he thought was odd. Whatever Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping and ended up having to go into therapy. They gave him some pills to calm him down and allow him to get decent night's sleep. As time went on, he recovered and ended up being fine. But to this day, he still can't sleep unless the curtains on his window are completely shut. To this day, I still cannot explain what we saw on the lake that night. I never went back to the cabin. Tommy and Kevin had both gone back and everything was fine. But Ryan refuses to go back and frankly, I'm with him on this one. This happened to me in 1970s. To be exact, it was November 23rd, 1971. I was 20 years old at the time and was really down on my luck. I was living in Portland, but I'm from Seattle and I'll be going home very soon. I had lost my job and was about to be evicted from my apartment because I couldn't pay the rent. I will be flying back home to stay with my parents until I could find a new job or somehow get the money for my apartment which would be very unlikely. I had one night left in my apartment before leaving. I didn't feel like staying home, so I decided to go for a walk and have a drink in a bar. On my way to the bar, I stopped at a convenience store and purchased a lottery ticket. I walked down the street and entered a nearby bar, where I ordered myself a beer. Not long after that, a man came inside and sat next to me and ordered a drink. We got to talking about life and just general conversation when he mentioned he was going to a flight the next day to Seattle. I laughed and asked him, wait, flight 305? He laughed and said, yeah, that's the one. He asked me why I was heading there. I told him I had money troubles and coincidentally, he said the same thing. He seemed like a nice guy. We talked for about another hour before he decided to call it a night. Unfortunately, I never called his name. I was about to leave the bar myself shortly after that when I heard over the TV that the lottery numbers would be announced. I decided to stay and check if I had won, why not? And would you believe it, I won, $15,000. Of course, I was beyond belief with shock. And of course, I wouldn't need to go back home because I had money now. The next day I saw something on the news that A flight had been hijacked, and the plane was being held at ransom. It was the same flight I was going to be on, and I couldn't believe it, but the sketch of the guy they described who took the flight hostage was the exact same man I had been talking to in the bar. He used the name D.B. Cooper. If you didn't know, he threatened to explode the plane with a bomb unless he got $200,000, which he did then jumped out of the plane with the money and parachute and was never seen again. I didn't know why, but I never said anything to anyone. Even if I could, it's not like I knew his real name. It was such a scary coincidence that the only thing that stopped me was the reason why I was in that predicament anyway. I needed money and then I got some. It's strange how everything works out in life. When I was 17, I didn't have a driver's license. Most of the time I walk or hitchhike. There was this one night, there weren't that many cars on the road and it was very cold and this man pulled over. When the guy pulled over, I I took a good look at the guy and figured I could take him if he tried anything. He was on the slender side and had a strange frailness about him. 
even though he looked healthy enough. I got into the car after we agreed on the destination. We exchanged names and I warmed my fingers up in front of the heating vent. He spoke quietly, asking a few questions along the lines of, was I local and how did I like living there? He said he only been here for a few months, but found it beautiful and hoped he could find happiness there. That comment struck me as a little odd, but I brushed it off. It began to snow and the road quickly got slippery. So he slowed and he kept his eyes straight out the windshield, driving silently. I was okay with that, as small talk was never my forte. About 10 minutes later, I noticed the car near the intersection we were approaching seemed to be sliding, so I said, watch out. He immediately hit the gas, shooting through the intersection and burst out with, don't ever scream at me. Needless to say, I was taken aback. I said, look, this is close enough. Just pull over here and I can get there. He didn't seem to hear me. So I said, Richard, did you hear me? I said, you can pull over here and let me out. But no response. He just stared straight ahead, driving faster now than he did when it started snowing. To say I was scared doesn't seem to cover the death of the fear that began to arise in me. I didn't know if I should stay quiet or speak, but I was damn sure not going to yell after his outburst. After about a mile, he began to mumble under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but I assumed he was speaking to me. So I said, what did you say? I couldn't hear you. He began to speak quietly and rapidly saying things like, you're always yelling at me. I've told you time and time again, do not yell at me. I don't appreciate it. No, you don't listen. You don't listen. And I was just sitting there looking at him. I was at a complete loss. I didn't know what to say in response or if I should say anything at all. I contemplated just jumping out of the car, but nixed that idea when I realized the door lock was missing. There was just a silver lined hole where it should have been. I started to cry and debate with myself about causing an accident by grabbing the wheel and hoping for the best. When he suddenly looked at me for the first time since I had gotten in the car, he blinked several times rapidly, then slowed the car, pulling into a gas station. I waited to see if he unlocked the doors, not wanting to say anything to set him off again. After a minute or two, he quietly said, I think I better let you out of here. And he hit the button to the door locks and he opened the door. I wasn't about to hesitate, so I jumped out of the car as if I were on fire. I was about to turn and walk into the gas station when he called my name. He looked so damn sad and I hesitated. He apologized, said he was sorry if he had frightened me, that he never would have harmed me. And he asked if I'd be able to get home okay. I said I would and closed the door. He began to pull out of the gas station, but stopped suddenly. He just sat there for a couple of moments, his head down. I froze, wondering what the hell was up and was about to run into the gas station, but he opened his window and yelled at me, waving something in his hand, my hat. I left it on his seat. I slowly approached the side of his car and he handed it to me, apologizing again. I didn't know what else to say, so I just said, thanks. I watched as he drove off, making sure he was out of sight before moving on so he wouldn't know which direction I was heading. As I walked, I went to put my hat back on, and a piece of paper fell out of it. Folded into a paper was a $100 bill. The paper said, I'm sorry, please take a cab and don't hitchhike anymore tonight. I didn't. In fact, it was the last time I ever hitchhiked in my life. Would never, ever do that again.
one evening when I was in my junior year of high school. My mom and dad went out, leaving me home alone. I had a lot of homework to do, so I spent the whole evening sitting at a desk in my bedroom. My parents left the house around 6 p.m. When I was doing my homework, I put on my headphones and I listened to loud music. There was a big storm that night and my desk was facing the window so I could see the rain and the lightning outside. My parents got back around 11 p.m. When I saw their car drive up, I took off the headphones. As soon as my mom opened the front door and came inside, I heard her shout out my name. What on earth happened in here? She demanded in an angry voice. Confused, I ran downstairs. My mom was standing in the hallway with a furious look on her face. She pointed at the floor and yelled, was this you? I looked down and I saw that the carpet was covered in muddy footprints. I have no idea how those got there, I said. I spent the whole night at my desk doing my homework. I watched as the look on her face change from anger to confusion and then to fear. We both realized at the same time that someone else must have been in the house. We followed the trail of footprints, trying to make sense of the whole situation. They started at the back door, which we usually left unlocked. Then we noticed something else. The footprints started at the back door, but there was no trail of footprints leaving through the back door. All of a sudden, we hear something loud, a pounding noise that echoed throughout the house. Then the sound of the front door being wrenched open and slammed shut again. We all ran into the garage and locked the door behind us. My mom took out her cell phone and called the police. She told them to come quickly as she shouted that someone's in our house. After what seemed like hours, a patrol car arrived with two police officers, a male and a female. One officer stayed with us in the garage while his partner went through the house, searching room by room. When she came back, the female officer told us that there was no one in the house and it was safe to go back in. As we were all breathing a high sigh of relief, she asked, whose bedroom is upstairs on the left? My parents looked at me. It's mine, I told the officer. She asked us to follow her. As we walked through the house, we could see the trail of muddy footprints leading from the back door through the living room, through the hallway, up the stairs, into my parents' bedroom, then towards my room. They stopped at my doorway. The female officer pointed at my door, which had been open the whole night. Scrawled on it in black marker was the following. 847, I see you. 853, you forgot to lock the back door. 859, you seem focused. 924, turn around. 947, look at me. 1015, look at me. 1037, look at me. 1049, look at me. For more than two hours, someone had been standing in my doorway, watching me. To this day, I still shudder to think what would have happened if I had just turned around. This story happened about three years ago. When I was 16, I had my first boyfriend, Ben, who just so happened to be my next door neighbor. For the first few months of dating, we were going fine, up until I had dinner at Ben's house one evening. His dad, Graham, gave me the creeps. From the first moment I ever met him, he was creepy to me. He shook my hand tightly and had a big grin on his face with his big, bulging eyes. At the dinner, I swear Graham never took his eyes off of me at all. Every now and then, I would glance over to see if he was still staring at me, and of course he was. From then on, I spent more time around Ben's house. We would watch movies in his room, play video games, or just study homework. Whenever I was at Ben's house, his dad would always be lingering around. Like he would always burst into the bedroom without knocking, asking things like, 
how's everything? Or I thought I heard you calling me. Basically an excuse to come in. It's like he wanted to catch us doing something, if you know what I mean. And whenever I would go to the bathroom, of course, he would try and come in, even though the door was locked. He would knock and say, oh, I didn't realize someone was in the bathroom. This creepy stuff went on for a while, maybe about two months, but there was this one incident that really scared me. Ben asked if I can go to the basement and grab a couple of pops. I went down there and looked around in the fridge to see what drinks they had. Then I heard the door close. It was the basement door. And then his dad came walking down the steps. He asked me what I was doing down there and I told him I was just grabbing some pop for myself and Ben. I smiled and walked past him and headed up the stairs. I tried to open the basement door, but it was locked. His dad locked it behind him. I turned around and said, uh, sir, could you help? The door is stuck. He didn't reply. I went back downstairs and I saw his dad with his top off rolling a can of Sprite on his body saying, it's a hot day, isn't it? I was extremely uncomfortable. And I asked once more, could you open the door because it seems to be stuck? I didn't say lock because I didn't want him to know I was uncomfortable. He said to me, here's the key and place it on a small table next to him. And then he said, come and get it while smiling with his tongue rubbing against his teeth. I let out a nervous, awkward laugh as I thought he was joking. He wasn't. I crouched down to grab the key, but just as I did, I could feel his face near mine and he was smelling my hair. I could hear him really close breathing in through his nose. As soon as I got the key, I sped, walked up the stairs to open the basement door. I just left at that point, and I went home and cried in my bedroom. I never told anyone this story, and I broke up with Ben shortly after this incident. We lived there for two more years after that, until we moved away. Every now and then, I would see his dad in his garden or something, and he would always give me that same creepy smile like he did in the basement. My name is Chris, and this story happened to me last year when I was traveling with my dad across the United States. We were traveling in our RV. We were visiting Nevada. And of course, we had to go and check out Area 51. By the time we got there, it was pretty late and quite dark out. So we thought we would just park the RV, sleep, and check it out in the morning. That night, I think around 1 a.m., my dad was asleep and I was playing some games on my iPad when I heard some footsteps outside our RV. I took one of my earplugs out so I could listen better and it sounded like someone was slowly pacing. I took a subtle peek through our blinds. It was pitch black, but you could kind of see something moving. I woke my dad up telling him someone is out there. He took a look out the window and then told me to get a flashlight. I asked him, you're not going out there, are you? In a concerned voice, of course. But my dad said, we have to see what it is, nervously. We both went outside. We shone our light towards the figure. It looked to be a man with his back toward us. My dad spoke out. Hello? No answer. Or even any movement. My dad spoke again. Hello? Can you hear me? As we slowly got closer, you could see the man was wearing some kind of gown, like a hospital gown that patients wear. The man was still unresponsive. We got close enough to tap him on the shoulder, and the man slowly turned around. He looked kind of pale as like a ghost, and his eyes were black, like they weren't even human. He stared right at us, and my dad stepped back in shock. Then we heard a noise. It was more footsteps. My dad shined his light in a direction, and what was right in front of us were more men. Men in patient gowns, black eyes, looking right at us. Me and my dad ran back into the RV and drove as fast as we could away from the Area 51. We spent the rest of the night in the motel we found. We never went back to Area 51 after that. A few years ago when I was in college, I would take odd jobs to pay my half of the rent. One day in particular, I was babysitting a set of twin boys that were three years old. 
The mother told me she hired me because she would only hire men due to her crazy ex-husband. I was confused when she told me that, so I asked why. She showed me a picture of him and said not to answer the door for him, don't let him in, and to not let him see the kids. I just said okay. I thought she was being dramatic, but I went along with it. After she left, the kids seemed harmless, so I told my girlfriend to come over. After that, there was a knock at the door. I figured it was her, so I opened the door. It was the ex-husband. This guy looked a lot scarier in real life than he did in the pictures. He towered over me with tattoos everywhere, including his neck, a bald head, and gold teeth. He asked to see his kids. I didn't know what to do, so I just told him, hold on, and I closed the door. I really didn't know what to do, so I called the woman and she didn't answer, so I texted her. Still nothing. Eventually, he started knocking on the door some more. But I would talk through the door, letting him know that I can't let him in, nor could I let the children out to see him due to the mother's request. He didn't like that too much. I stopped talking, then the knocking stopped. And the man said, okay. But it was an okay that sounded like he was going to get me back for not letting him in. I look outside and I see that he pulled off. I didn't call the police because he left. So my girlfriend texted me and it said she'll be there in two minutes. Then a few minutes go by and she isn't there yet. Then I see one of the twins looking out the window and he says, there's daddy. I look out the window and I saw the most disturbing thing you could think of. The man was on top of my girlfriend, stabbing her repeatedly in the side of her head with a screwdriver. Her body was shaking, but she wasn't making any noise. And there was blood everywhere all over her head, face, ground in that man. I wanted to burst out of that door to help her, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. So I called the police. The man just stood there, staring at the house. He never tried to escape, just waited for the police as if he were crazy. The twin's mother and the cops showed up at the same time, and she was hysterical going between Spanish and English while crying. I felt numb, guilty, and ashamed that I called my girlfriend over, and she was killed. And I was a coward that stayed in the house. Till this day, I still feel the guilt. When I was 10 years old, I stayed at home by myself for the first time while my parents went out for a date. I was really into horror movies, so my imagination ran wild, so I had every light on in the house. I was scared, honestly, but not so much due to the lights. My parents told me they would be back by 10, so I wasn't really worried. I had food, blockbuster movies to watch, and my favorite game, Manhunt, on my PS2. By the way, this was 2004. It started to get dark outside, when all of a sudden a storm hit, and the lights went out. As soon as it happened, I ran into our living room near the front of the house with my flashlight. I was definitely afraid now. I decided to get under the covers on the couch. I tried to fall asleep, but I was so afraid I couldn't. I don't know why, but I peeked out from under the covers, and I swear, I saw the silhouette of a man in the corner of the room. I jumped back under my covers, breathing heavily. Then all I heard was slow, methodical footsteps. They were coming toward me. Then I heard whispering along with the footsteps. My heart was pumping out of my chest at this point. Then the sound stopped. I just laid there frozen. No sound. Go! I got up and ran out of the house because it felt like someone touched my arm. And I know I heard someone yell the word go. I pretty much ran out of the house with the blanket over my head. I ran to my neighbor's house. I told them what happened and they called the cops from their cell phones. My parents arrived a little later than they expected due to bad traffic. They seemed angry about what happened. The police say that there was no evidence of a break-in. 
I still to this day remember that feeling of fear, but I really don't know if it were my imagination or not. About a year ago in my final semester in college, I worked at a department store in the mall. I didn't have a car yet, so I asked for the day shifts because it was a two hour bus ride back home. So basically, if I had a closing shift, I'd get done at 11 but not get home until around 1 a.m. But sometimes I'd be given a closing shift, much to my annoyance since I had class at 6 a.m. And my mother worries about me because who wants their kid on public transportation at night? My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of closing shifts, knowing my situation. I was pissed, but whatever. So one night, I had just finished my shift and I got on the bus. I sat in the middle of the bus. It was minding my own business with my earbuds in. I usually did that because I didn't like people talking to me, so I made it look like I was listening to music. And I occupied myself by playing a crossword puzzle on my phone. About five seats behind me, I hear these guys speak in Spanish. Now my mother is Dominican, but people never know that I am. So while I understand a fair bit of Spanish, I don't speak it. So I hear them talking, but I don't pay any attention because it's rude to eavesdrop. All until they say, that kid in front of us. Then my ears perk up. I keep my earbuds in so that they think I can't hear them. And I continue to listen. What they're saying is horrific. To paraphrase it, they knew my stop because they've been watching me for this week. And to put it simply, they were planning on snatching me. I heard them say that I'll disappear like the others. I was about 20 minutes away from home, so I knew I had to act quickly. Since I knew they could see me, there were five seats behind me, but like a cross, if that makes sense. I pretended to play on my phone, oblivious while I was actually texting my mom. Then all of a sudden, one of the guys moved three seats ahead of me, and the other one moved about three seats behind me. And we're the last ones on the bus. I text my mom, can you please meet me at the bus stop? Five minutes go by, no answer. We're getting closer to my stop, so I decided to call her cell. No answer. I'll call the house phone and she finally answers. At this point, it's about 12.30 a.m., so she was asleep. I try to talk as calmly as I can. This was our conversation. Hey, Mom, did you get my text? Uh, no. What's up? Oh, I sent you a picture of these jeans I'm going to order online when I get home. I really need your opinion, so I really need you. Really need you to look since the sale ends at 1 a.m. She gets the hint that I need her to look at her cell phone. So I say goodbye and I hope for the best. I tied my Adidas very tight. We get to my stop and I see my mom's car. I stand up. Then the man in front of me stands up. Then the guy behind me stands up. I snatch my stuff and I sprint to the door and I got off the bus with both men behind me, both yelling at each other to grab me. I didn't even look behind me. My mom sees the whole thing and jumps out of the car. I yell at her to get back in the car because they couldn't catch me, a hard ass. I jump in the car and I tell my mom, just go. I look in the rear view and I see the guy staring at the car. The next morning, I called my job and I tell them that I quit. No more public transportation for me. Thanks to my mom for teaching me Spanish, and thanks to my mom for getting the hint.